Hello everyone, welcome back to Cambridge A-Level Biology with me, I'm Dr. Demi and in this video I am going to show you the solutions to the 2022 specimen paper 4. For those of you who do not know, a specimen paper is a paper that is released every time the syllabus changes so that you have an idea of what to expect in the upcoming exams due to the new syllabus. But what this also tells you is that the questions have changed a bit. Now, when we say the syllabus changes in CIE, there's nothing much to worry about. Most of the time, things have been removed as opposed to things being added. So you don't have to worry about what you're not covering, but rather what you don't need to study for the exams. And I've done a video about that. So please have a look at it if you're not sure of what exactly has been removed from which chapter. I think I've covered most of the chapters um, so you can, I covered all of the chapters actually, so you can have a look at that. So I want us to get into this. This is part one of this paper. I have sort of figured that it's easier to do shorter videos that you can um, sort of just get onto and be able to watch. This video is for members only. So thank you to whoever's watching this because that means you're a member. Really appreciate the support and I hope that you're finding all of these videos very helpful for your learning. All right, let's start. Um, and this is a question I started doing in the live that I had on Sunday, the 10th of April, which is the same day I'm recording this video. Um, but I, I sort of decided not to do it because I felt it wasn't engaging enough. And I know that students don't really like these questions, but you have to know them. Please bear in mind that for your paper four, you must pay attention to chapters 17, 18 and 19. They are the least favorite chapters for most students, but they are also the most important if you want to do well in the exams. Um, and obviously all the other chapters are important, homeostasis, coordination, photosynthesis. They are equally important, but um, these ones that you like the least are not going to go away simply because you don't like them. So let's have a look here. It says the II, I think that's what it's called, Dobentonia madagascariensis, is a mammal native to Madagascar. They are active at night and they make their nest high up in trees. They feed on insects, larvae in the trunks of trees. Again, this image here is not supposed to tell you any biological facts. So except you're told to make reference to the image, I wouldn't spend time looking at it. Um, the question then goes on to say the International, the International Union for Conservation of Nature categorizes this animal as endangered. This means that it has a very high risk of being extinct in the wild. Now the question is, name the domain to which the II belongs. So first things first that you have to remember is that for CIE, you only have to know three domains and those are Archaea. Um, Archaea. Why am I writing that? Um, it's the wrong spelling. It should be Archaea. Okay. Um, you also have Procaria. And you have eukarya. Okay. Um, so the domain that this belongs simply because it's a mammal would be eukarya. All right. So that's the answer there. It's not a prokaryote and it's also not an archaea. The differences between archaea and prokarya are not that much. Um, so you can go and have a look at that. It's just that most of the archaea that you find um, tend to grow in like higher temperatures and things like that. But that's something that you can easily um, learn. If you know your chapter one, then these um, tend to be okay um, for the most part. So state one reasons why they may have become endangered in this regard. You can just think about their habitat. So it says that they make their nests high up in trees. They're active at night. So one reason why they might have been endangered is that maybe they are losing their habitat due to def deforestation. So loss of habitat um, due to deforestation. Um, it could also be that they are being hunted um, by other predators and things like that. So there's so many things that you can think of here. This is loss. Um, but remember that if it's just one mark, then you only need to give one thing. And it does say here, name one reason, state one reason. Then here it says, suggest ways in which zoos may be able to protect these species from extinction. So because it says suggest ways and it doesn't give you the exact number of ways you should suggest, just again, look at the points as guidance. If there are three marks, that means you need to give three different points. And some of the ways here, which are things that you learn uh, mostly in chapter 18, is that zoos can do captive breeding. 
um, which is more or less what um, zoos are really well known for. They do a lot of captive breeding. Zoos also serve as research facilities. Um, zoos also provide education and awareness. When you go to the zoo um, to look at the animals, it's not just about staring at them and going, oh, that is such a cute lion. But um, in some cases, you're also able to um, to learn a bit about them, especially if you read some of the descriptions that are attached to them. So they also raise awareness about um, different species or different organisms um, and also they can provide like care for these organisms so that they don't go extinct so yeah that is some of the ways that they can protect them from extinction again you only have to write three because it says um, there are three points then it goes on to say there are two ii two main ii positions on the island of madagascar one in the west and one in the east um, and then it goes on and shows us a map here of Madagascar, of the Madagascar island. And it then says a study into the variation in the DNA nucleotide sequence shows that there's a large um, genetic, there's a large variation in the DNA or a large genetic difference between the Western population and the Eastern population. The two populations of RI may be evolving into two separate species. So this is where you find the West population and this is where you have the East population. And you can see here, so what I want you to pay attention here is what you've been provided with. They are separated by a river, first of all, and also by a mountain range which means that these um, species have been highly separated or they've been geographically separated. And if you've been following this chapter, which by the way, I recommend you watch the videos that I did, you'll remember that I said um, allopatric speciation um, is speciation that occurs or the occurrence of new species or the emergence of new species due to geographic um, separation. So let's see what the question is asking us here. It says, with reference to figure 1.2, suggest why there is a large difference between the two populations. So first things first, you can say there is a geographical barrier that's more or less like the very obvious one. Um, or you can say they've been geographically separated, but it's always nice to say um, there's a geographical barrier. So remember, it says with reference to figure 1.2, so with reference to this figure, so you don't have to go and start thinking of random things. Make sure you're looking at the figure. So there's a geographical barrier due to the presence of the mountain, um, the mountain range um, and the river. OK, so that has resulted in the populations basically being at different ends and um, being exposed to very different um, very different um, selection pressures, so very different selection pressure. Um, and also here in this case, if there are different selection pressures, that it means that there will be different allele frequencies between them. So that's something else that you can mention, first, uh, different selection pressures um, resulting in different alleles. Um, so that's resulting in different alleles. And as a result of that, um, the populations have what we call the genetic drift. So that, that results in genetic drift. So I think all of these would actually give you full five points. Um, you only have to write five things because it says five marks over here. And then it obviously says what type of speciation is most likely to occur. It's allopatric speciation. Remember, allopatric speciation is speciation that happens due to separation by geographical barriers, while sympatric speciation is separation that happens due to changes in behavior. Um, so those are two different things. So yeah, that's that on this one. And this one I did during the live, but I thought I'd include here again. And again, this is going to be a nice short video because I realized that the nicer and shorter the videos are, the easier it is for you guys to actually watch them to the end. Um, when they're too long, it seems as though you might struggle based on the feedback I'm getting from YouTube. So I'm trying to keep these videos nice and short and simple and easy for you to follow. So figure 2.1, diagram of a motor neuron. And you can see here, this is the motor neuron. 
and it says you need to lean this structure so we spoke about this already on the live but if you were not there i'm just going to go over it again please always pay attention to what the arrows or the lines are pointing at so over here with a a is pointing to the space between these two um, boxes or two rectangles and b is pointing you need to make sure you look closely at the line that's between them so at this point over here okay that's where b is pointing at um so just wanted to point that out c is very obvious wherever you see a nucleus inside the neuron that is the cell body so i just go right there and write cell body immediately um, and for B over there, it is the axon. So that's the axon. And for A, which is right there, um, that's what you call the node of Ranvier. Okay, node of Ranvier. The node of Ranvier is the space uh, between the myelinated parts of the, of the neuron. Again, what's the function of a motor neuron? Just for two marks, the motor neuron um, will transmit impulses from the central nervous system to the um, to what's it called? So from central nervous system to the effector or the muscle gland. So an example of that is if you think of the fact that if you sit on something hot, there is a sensory neuron that detects that this is a hot surface that you've just sat on. Perhaps you sit on a stove or something which by the way I don't recommend doing but let's assume you made an error and you sat on a stove um, your sensory neuron on your butt will send a message um, to your um, relay neuron and the relay neuron will say oh my god she's sitting on the stove or he's sitting on the stove and then that then takes um, the message obviously to the central nervous system and central nervous system sends a message to the motor neuron and the motor neuron sends a message to your butt muscle so that they can get up very quickly before you burn yourself so that is more or less what the motor neuron does and then it says here with reference to figure 2.1 explain the fast transmission of impulses along a motor neuron so again always bear in mind that when they say with reference to please make sure that you're looking at the figure very clearly and that you understand what the figure is saying don't just pull answers out of thin air because you're like oh i think i know this or this is what i remember and just write those down if you want to get good marks so with reference to figure 2.1 what can we see in 2.1 again i've gone over this in the live but i'm just going to put it up here again you can see that the there are schwann cells and you know that schwann cells make up the myelin sheath so what you can see is that um the neuron is myelinated um myelinated um, and you can see it is surrounded by Schwann cells or Schwann cells depending on where you're from I don't know I just call them Schwann cells because I have no idea what else to call them um, if it's surrounded by Schwann cells it means that the impulses will jump from one node to the other you need to watch my videos on coordination too remember this so um, impulses jump from one node of Ranvier to the next so um, oh, for some reason I'm stuck okay so I'm back I don't know why I got stuck there um, but impulses jump from one node of Ranvier to the next um, that is saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction, and um, that results in the axon um, coordinating the impulses a lot faster. And as a result of that, there's a faster transmission. All of this is explained in the videos uh, that I did on coordination. So by all means, please watch those videos. Okay, let's look at question three. It says corals grow in shallow sea water. Corals consist of colonies of small animals called polyps. These polyps have photosynthetic proctics, proctists called algae within their cells. 
which is advantageous both to the coral polyps and to the algae. The algae that lives within the cells of coral polyps can also live independently as free living algae. The rate of photosynthesis of algae that live within the cells of coral polyps is higher than that of free living algae. Suggest and explain why the rate of photosynthesis in algae within the cell is higher than that of free living algae. So in this case, something that you can actually think of that you don't need to write down, but you can think of is the endosymbiont theory. Um, the endosymbiont theory is a theory in biology that suggests that the chloroplast and the mitochondria used to exist on their own as prokaryotic organisms before um, they were engulfed by a eukaryotic cell and then you know they continue to work within those cells and that explains why pro um, the mitochondria and the chloroplast have their own DNA and their own ribosomes and their own basically all of their own cell machinery so you can think of that but you wouldn't write it down here and I'll tell you why that's because this is paper four and in paper four they're asking you a very different question even though that knowledge helps you it's not necessarily what's going to give you marks here so why is the rate of photosynthesis in algae that leaves in the cell that leave in the cells of coral polyps higher in this case just think of the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis so first of all there'll be a higher rate of um of carbon dioxide that is available so if there's more carbon dioxide available then the rate of photosynthesis will be higher um, you can also think of the fact that the coral polyps supply this carbon dioxide by respiring so perhaps the coral polyps take in oxygen they give out co2 and then they give out that co2 the co2 is captured by the algae that live within them and so that helps the algae have access to higher um rate higher levels of co2 and then increases the rate of photosynthesis um, you can also then talk about if the rate of photo if there's a higher concentration of co2 that's available then it means the light independent reaction of photosynthesis can occur easily because co2 um, is able to bind with rubp which is facilitated by rubisco so again just to put that there um and because this says suggest and explain, I would say write it, um, don't write it as an outline, even though I used to advise students to write in outlines. I've realized that now that the syllabus is changing, there are also guidance, new guidance for the markers and you need to write in prose form, but make sure everything you write correlates with each other and is true. Um, so higher CO2 concentration um, and you can say this is due to respiration by polyps due to respiration by polyps i'm just going to write that as resp um, um, this allows the light independent reaction light independent i'm just going to write that as light ind light independent reaction to Occur. This allows the light independent reaction to occur um, um, so that CO2 binds with RUBP, binds with RUBP in the presence of Rubisco. Okay, and that should give you four marks. Um, it's just three marks that's required here. So that should do it um, in this regard. Okay. Then it says, um, this is the last slide, by the way, um, because I've, like I said, I'm trying to make these videos much shorter than they um, used to be. I'll do part two, so don't worry too much about, oh my goodness, where's part two? I'm going to do part two. Um, but I, I'm just picking out um, the, the questions and trying to shorten the video. So here it says photosynthesis in the algae living within the cells of coral polyps is the same as photosynthesis in plants. Then outline the process of cyclic phosphorylation. Now this is something that's very interesting because typically in biology, a lot of the questions that come out don't refer to cyclic phos photophosphorylation at all. But now I see that cyclic phosphorylation is making a comeback and there is a chance that they might ask you in the exam. So I'm just going to explain that very quickly. It's very easy. There's nothing difficult about it. What happens with cyclic phosphorylation is that you have a photosystem and that photosystem is photosystem one. Okay. 
Um, and what happens with photosystem one is that you have light energy. So I'm just going to draw the sun here, um, even though that looks more like a cockroach. Um, so the sun shines and the light energy is absorbed by photosystem one. Um, um, sorry, it is absorbed by accessory pigments. If you think of the tylacoid, the way the tylacoid is arranged, it is um, absorbed by these accessory pigments such as um, carotene and eventually the light um, is passed down to photosystem one, which is going to be um, chlorophyll A. All right. Once the light hits chlorophyll A, it results in the excitation of an electron um, and that electron moves to a higher level or basically it becomes excited. And the electron is then passed on to what we call an electron acceptor um, that's somewhere up here. OK, it's passed on to an electron acceptor. Once it's passed on to the electron acceptor, it is then passed through the electron transport chain and passed back um, to photosystem one and in the process um, it makes ATP um, but the whole point of this is that the cyclic phosphorylation is a cyclic process in the sense that the electron that gets excited um, also returns back to the photosystem in non-cyclic phosphorylation that's not what happens and you can watch the video on non-cyclic phosphorylation so this is the end here if you have any questions again you can put a comment um, under this video as members i get to see your comments right on top um, so i'm able to respond um, you always get responses if you're a member if you're not a member then you know it is what it is if i feel like it's a question that's been answered by someone else then it is just a matter of you know hoping that you read the other comments and you're able to answer that um, this is question three for this paper question four i did as a general video for everyone so please watch question four it's also another nice and short and easy straightforward video and in the next video i will then do five six um seven and eight um, which, are, which are a bit long, but um, I think that would be a bit of a longer video than this one. Then I'll do questions 9 and 10 separately as well, because I feel like those are longer questions that you have to answer in paper 4 that um, you might just need um, separate time for. But for now, this is the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for supporting the channel. Please get your friends to support as well. I appreciate you and I am glad that you are on board and I wish you good luck in your examination preparation. Thank you.